welcome everyone to the October Hadley School Committee meeting. May I have a motion to um, open this meeting? Motion to open the meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, Aye. terrific. Thank you. Um, we are all here except Paul Pfeiffer. And so um, let's move on to the um, adjustments to the agenda. So our adjustments to the agenda this evening, if you're looking at the agenda online, the adjustments to the agenda are highlighted. Um, I included in our discussion of COVID-19 mitigation strategies for 21-22, a discussion of the Hadley Board of Health just extended its mask advisory and our vaccine rates in Hadley Public Schools. Um, policy subcommittee, uh, we will discuss a first reading of a flag policy um, and other business that was discussed at policy subcommittee. And um, we will need to appoint school committee representatives for unit A negotiations and unit D negotiations as the chair has received a request from the president of the HEA to uh, enter into negotiations for the next contract cycle. Terrific, thank you. And those are highlighted in the um, agenda doc if anyone wants to find those adjustments. Okay, we're moving into public comment. And as a reminder, um, these are limited to three minutes and um, uh, generally pertain to the topics on the agenda and do not necessarily um, uh, receive a um, comments back or discussion from the school committee. And so we'll go ahead and open it up if, uh, if anyone has any comments from the public, please go ahead and raise your digital hand and we will take you off mute to hear you. Okay, I think, I think we are without comment this evening. Terrific, moving to presentations and discussion items. Uh, item number one, superintendent awards. Annie? Yes, and so I would ask that if Kyle and his family aren't able to make it tonight. Another adjustment may be that we ask them if they want to come in November to present the award. But I believe, I just want to confirm um, that Eve is here and I believe I've made the family co-host. Let's make sure I did that. So I'm gonna confirm that they're here. And um, then, Yay, good, <laughs> great. You don't have to be on camera. I just wanna make sure you were here so you can hear all the wonderful things we have to say about you. And so Eve is being presented with the NASDAQ Award for student leadership and for academic excellence. And that's New England School Development Council. Academically, Eve ranks second in her extremely competitive class with a 4.48 weighted GPA. And I can tell you that is right behind 4.51. So this is extremely competitive and neck and neck. Um, Eve has taken many challenging courses such as AP United States History, AP Language and Composition, College Level Pre-Calculus, College Level Calculus, and several courses at our local community college at Greenfield Community College. And she's enrolled in our early college high school program um, and is always seeking to challenge herself and expand her knowledge. You have made many lasting impacts to our school and to the community at large. Eve is the co-president of the student council. She was selected by her peers, elected by her peers to represent the student body. She swims competitively, is captain of the cross country team, a member of the jazz and pep band, she has earned her bronze and silver award in scouting and is working toward her gold award right now. And that's just huge, so much work. She are incredibly dedicated to making our entire community and just the world at large a better place. You are described by the adults at Hopkins as one of the first people to volunteer when a friend or peer needs help. And as uh, the guidance, Counselor said, Ms. Sear said, I can always, that's a big word, not most of the time, but always count on Eve to be a positive influence on her peers. And I would like to say that when I looked at, and I, I, there's so many wonderful things to say about you, Eve, but this, this little odd thing, I guess it would be odd for me, just, just grabbed me by the heart. So students often put together 
resumes to help adults write them letters of recommendation. And the organization of Eve's resume, now one would expect some, a young person, their professional experience would not be incredibly long. And usually what's typical is right after that, students have their list of awards. That's, that's the order of things, awards, skills, and the very last thing, and extracurriculars, and then usually the last thing is volunteerism. And for Eve, professional experience and immediately volunteer work, uh, which you've done, you've done a great deal. But yes, isn't that just, it just says so much about who you are, Eve. So I am honored to present you with this award, which will be given to you tomorrow at Hopkins. So it's, obviously I can't hand it through the computer. Um, and it's a certificate, but so much more than a certificate. It really is a way for all of us, the school committee, myself, the leadership in HAPI, the adults and your peers and the community at large to say thank you, Eve, just for being you. Thank you and congratulations. Congratulations, Eve. Thank you, Eve. It's been a pleasure uh, working alongside you, seeing you in the school community and um, congratulations to you and your family. Thank you guys so much. And congratulations to parents. Too, we've enjoyed her a lot too. <laughs> Terrific, thank you so much, Annie, for recognizing the students who are excelling. Um, it really is a wonderful thing to see that. And um, we look forward to hearing from, um, uh, about Kyle's accomplishments, hopefully next month. Um, thank you for that again. Thank All right. I am going to remove your co-host privileges um, if you're dying to co-host, you can always let us know. Uh, <laughs> All right. Terrific. Thank you. Okay. So item B on the agenda, COVID-19 mitigation strategies for 21-22. Annie. Sure. So just an update because it's hard to keep up and it's, uh, it gets pretty confusing. Um, so on September 27th, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education promulgated a mask requirement. So that was on September 27th. They said that it would be in effect uh, to at least November 1st. Um, I would like you to know that there is some discussion right now about whether or not just in general, I hear school committees talking about wondering, will the department extend that? We don't know that yet, but we do know that this is in effect until November 1st. And that uh, requirement said that as of October 15th, if a school demonstrates a vaccination rate of 80% or more for all students and staff in the school through an attestation form submitted to the department, then vaccinated individuals in that school would no longer be subject to the mask requirement. However, in our community, so although really good news here, really, really good news, I'm gonna open it up over here for me. People have access to it through the agenda. Um, and they see the weekly dashboard every week in the superintendent weekly newsletter. So great news. Uh, we have remarkably high vaccination rates among faculty and staff. And um, the students even are at 77.73. So let's say 78%, I just updated it today, 78% of just students, not counting faculty at Hopkins, 78% are fully vaccinated. And that brings um, our total staff and students at Hopkins Academy to essentially 81%, which means we could apply for attestation. The reason, or we could submit, excuse me, we could submit an attestation form, which would mean that we no longer, vaccinated individuals would not be required to wear masks at Hopkins Academy. However, the school committee has always taken into consideration, which I would argue is very good practice because um, we are one department within a town, the recommendations of the Hadley Board of Health. The Hadley Board of Health had a mask requirement that they passed in September. And on October 24th, 2021, and you see that in adjustments to the agenda, if anyone in the public wanted to um, see the extension of this, the Board of Health, 
has extended that advisory beginning on October 24th for at least 30 more days, which will bring us essentially to November 22nd. I am assuming that we would not um, submit an attestation form until the Hadley Board of Health um, had, had altered or rescinded um, its mask requirements. So I just wanna to explain to the public and the school committee that while I'm absolutely thrilled about where we are with vaccination rates, um, that right now the Hadley Board of Health um, has its own mask requirement. And Hadley Board of Health, if the community is saying, well, gosh, why is that? I don't get that. Um, what can I show? Oh, on the dashboard, when people are on the weekly dashboard, on the very first tab, uh, the, there's, a, there's a, like a key for CDC community transmission thresholds. And all the data that we keep in the dashboard or that I supply in the dashboard about Hampshire County and about Hadley, the CDC thresholds apply to counties. So I imagine that the Hadley Board of Health is looking at those CDC thresholds. And even though things are definitely trending in the right direction, we had a, a peak in Hampshire County of uh, an average previous seven day case count of 341 back on September 16th. And now as of 1022, that had dropped to 72. It's definitely trending in the right direction. It is still considered substantial. Um, 49 or less is considered moderate and CDC recommends that in communities with substantial or high transmission that even vaccinated people wear masks in public spaces. So I just also, I don't want people thinking that our local board of health is just kind of randomly doing things. And I say this because sometimes it's confusing, right? To keep track of all of this. So the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education Put out a mass requirement that is set to potentially expire on November 1st and said as of October 15th, if you had 80% or greater in a school building of all staff and students who are vaccinated, which Hopkins has, has met that threshold, you could submit an attestation form allowing vaccinated individuals to remove their mask. However, we also have a board of health that is monitoring CDC thresholds and community transmission rates and community data. And at this point in time has extended its mask requirement. Um, so at this point in time, we are one, just in a mask requirement and I am not submitting the request at this point in time. I don't want people to hear that that would never happen, but at this point in time for the reasons I just stated. And that was just meant to be an update for folks. Thank you, Annie. Uh, I'm not sure that this really requires a, a discussion, uh, but I, uh, I've been doing a fair amount of sort of getting outside of the home now and um, uh, in, in Massachusetts as well as in other states. And um, just the general sentiment seems to be, um, it is just not prudent to remove the mask indoors. That's what I'm hearing. And I'm hearing a lot more about boosters these days and uh, potency of um, vaccination status and how that varies depending on what kind of vaccination that you received. And um, I've also read a fair amount that says that, you know, in a pandemic like this, the ebb and flow could um, vary greatly and what, we, even though 72 seems really low, gosh, all it takes is about 72 for it to spiral back up again if we're not very cautious. And so it doesn't, it doesn't seem to me to be too much to ask to extend it just until right about Thanksgiving. Um, that's that's uh, my personal feeling on it. Yeah, and I'll just weigh in. I'm, I'm supportive of the Board of Health's um, direction. I appreciate their leadership in this. Um, and I think just, you know, following um, their guidance in terms of our, um, our buildings or town buildings, and we have uh, employees inside that I think are, um, uh, you know, we want, we've always had the health and safety of them and the children uh, at the foremost. So, I appreciate their leadership on this, and I think it, it makes a lot of sense to follow their guidance uh, as a town. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And I will just with that, a final yay, I, out, I highlighted the rates of vaccination in our district, which are fantastic. And I will also say in Hampshire County, uh, the vaccination rate for 12 to 17 year olds as of October 22nd, fully vaccinated, not one dose, two weeks after, if it's a two dose regimen, 71.5%. That is just fantastic, 12 to 17 year olds in Hampshire County. So um, thank you. Thank you to everybody who's doing whatever bit they can to, to help us all. Annie, a quick question. Um, and I that's great. Those numbers are wonderful. And I know you've advertised a number of um, vaccination opportunities and clinics that we've been able to offer right on site. Um, Humera mentioned booster. Uh, uh, shots and with, uh, I believe, Moderna being approved. Um, and th I think we're at the stage of uh, understanding, you know, some options for everybody. Is that something that you've explored in terms of offering a booster opportunity for staff on site? So the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education hasn't uh, recommended doing that at this point. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't. I think that the thinking is that they are so readily available and easy to get at this point uh, at pharmacies everywhere. Um, it may be that when um, the authorization comes through, which may have happened today, and I just haven't seen the news, for uh, younger children, then uh, that may be something, although I would imagine many parents may go to I don't know, but that could be something that um, that it makes sense because there could be like high demand all at once. There could be high demand all at once, but the booster is not that we wouldn't. It just hasn't been discussed. And I think it hasn't been discussed because they are so um, widely available and relatively easy to schedule an appointment at any pharmacy or yeah, at any even storefront pharmacy as well as doctor's offices. It's a really good question, um, Heather. And I know that um, educators um, sometimes um, have a hard time getting away during the school day and, um, and, and gaining access to some of those appointments. So if it were to become available, that's a, that, that might help ease and help some of our um, more at-risk educators gain access. So worth asking the question of our um, leaders at DESE to see if um, those uh, vaccine mobiles could come back and also provide boosters in addition to those shots, whether they could do for a twofer. Um, yeah. That'd be great. Sure. Okay, thank okay. you. And um, the next item is update on school committee strategic planning session. Annie. Yes, so just want to uh, start talking to the public about some of the ideas that we talked about exploring. And in some cases, um, these may be things that you see referenced in school strategy improvement plans, which are subject to school committee approval. Just wanna start talking to folks about some of the ideas that um, were creative ideas that, and it was about brainstorming and what are some possibilities. So in no way do I wanna imply that this is, this is our seven point plan that's starting tomorrow. This is really was answering the question of what are some unexplored possibilities that may Increase enrollment, uh, the entire region is seeing declines in enrollment, predominantly as a result of lower birth rates. Um, and uh, so what are some of the ways that we might encourage uh, additional enrollment? So one thing that we talked about was what might it look like and what are, the, what are the benefits and what might it look like to recruit international students through something called an F1 visa program. It's a very specific visa program. Under the F-1 visa program, the international student, their family is responsible for paying for the costs associated with providing an education to the student. And um, that's essentially a tuition charge. And that's not something that it would be, we're deciding that, that's, that's laid out in the F-1 visa process. Another idea we talked about was um, looking at how we can expand early college high school to include chapter 74 trade. So uh, students who are interested in things like carpentry and culinary and, and electrical. And this is in no way to say that we don't think the world of our regional vocational schools, but for those students who say, I wish there was a way that I could pursue this and 
stay at Hopkins Academy. So that was one idea to possibly explore and make that an option. Another idea that we talked about was looking to, and we've talked about this for a while, a chapter 74 program in public safety. Um, currently, the only recognized chapter 74 program is in criminal justice. And we know that our students have indicated their interest in more of a broader options within protective services occupation, including firefighters. And so right now we, we're talking about and we've started preliminary discussions and planning with Hadley Public Safety and Greenfield Community College to say, what kind of program might we create that would give students the options of exploring a variety of protective services careers um, and uh, potentially earn enroll in credit bearing college courses at Greenfield Community College in some of these fields. So the best elements of early college high school best elements of innovation pathways. How can we create additional internship opportunities for our students over at the public safety complex, which they seem to really enjoy, um, as well as uh, provide high quality career and technical training. So we're looking at that as well. Uh, developing language programs at the elementary school. Um, and as you are aware, we're already experimenting with that with a Spanish lab and the students seem to absolutely love it. Every time I walk through the cafeteria over there, every student is greeting everyone in Spanish or certainly uh, Mr. Roman Perez, one of our staff members, uh, a fluent Spanish speaker, his first language is Spanish and uh, bilingual staff member and the students are just eating it up. They're absolutely enjoying it. We talked about ways that we might think of making senior year um, provide greater opportunities for personalization and individualization, the recognition that every single student doesn't need or desire the same experience. Um, and so what does that mean and what might it look like? And we've talked about this for a while. This is a long-term goal is to truly figure out how we can make what's called a wall-to-wall -wall option of early college high school, which is where a student who wanted to, not required of all students, but a student who wanted to would have the option of graduating with both a diploma and potentially an associate's degree. Uh, we also talked about the use of ESSER funds and we reviewed data from the input from families and um, families and faculty and facilities improvements and safety via school safety via facilities improvements or related to facilities improvements was definitely a top priority. Um, and with that, we also talked a bit about the Mass School Building Authority process and how we might create stronger statements of interest. We have submitted a state statement of interest twice now, um, and uh, we haven't been invited into the process of a major renovation. So one of the recommendations we were given actually by the Mass School Building Authority is to consider perhaps having a facilities checkup, like somebody looking at Hopkins top to bottom and making recommendations and evaluating the condition of all elements of the facilities that would help drive improvements to our HVAC system and would also be something that we could submit with our statement of interest. So that is something we will look to do this year in preparation for submitting another statement of interest. Um, and uh, that was really the first brainstorming session. And our second session, we talked a great deal about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, um, and what that means, what it means to be an anti-racist district, um, how we build off of the resolution the school committee passed in August of 2020, 2020 right? Or was it this past August, 2021? Uh, the, the school committee resolution with that, uh, they, that was passed. So how do we build on that? And how do we link uh, the work that we're doing around social and emotional learning and positive behavioral intervention supports, responsive classroom and restorative justice. How do we integrate this work in a meaningful way so people don't feel as though it's just, we just are chasing different disparate initiatives um, and spent a great deal of discussion on that. And the big takeaway there, um, which I had higher hopes for myself that I would have a, um, a sample now for you, although thankfully the school committee is wise and knows me better than I know myself, apparently, because you would ask that by June that we have an, a possible dashboard so that we could be clear about what's our vision 
what's our current reality, what are our strategies for closing the gap, and how do we evaluate our progress? How do we stay on top of this? And regularly see this at school committee meetings and make sure that we're looking at it regularly. Um, I had said, oh, I'll have that to you by next month. Well, like I said, you guys know me better than I know myself, but I'm still going to beat June. That I'm going on the record, but <laughs> it's, it's going to be next month. Um, so, and the kinds of things we would look at at an equity dashboard, and if the public is interested in what we mean by this, we're not talking about, when you talk about a dashboard, that's not saying um, we're going to do this specific, it's, it's, it's not talking about curriculum specifically, like a specific curriculum we're using. It's, it's actually just looking at quantitative and qualitative data that tells us, you know, do we, do we see disproportionality anywhere? Like, when we look at our discipline data, when we look at our graduation data, when we look at access to higher level courses, or even who's participating in extracurricular activities like athletics, who's going on field trips? Um, so who's participating in what? Kind of that's the quantitative data. And then we also ask, and I wonder why that's happening. And then we dig in and try to, and ask people for their individual experiences that help us to understand Here's the what we see, and here's why some of these things might be happening. So we are evaluating data, gathering additional data, and that's what you see in a dashboard. And then you regularly look at that and try to see, well, where are we making progress and where are we still seem, where do we still seem to struggle? And that's any any school committee member can also please feel free to add in. Thank you, Annie. I think you um really captured well <laughs> two somewhat full uh, long afternoons of a uh, really vibrant discussion with the school committee and the administrators. And um, I think one thing I want to um, highlight is I really appreciated our discussion about like imagining these possibilities, but not necessarily committing to any one of them just yet, but rather prototyping in a, uh, a not very expensive and not very difficult kind of way, uh, what that could look like to, in order to see if there's an appetite for it um, amongst the school community and also with parents who might consider uh, choosing in. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. And I, I think the fact that we've gotten such great resonance with the the Spanish lab is a, an example of that, right? It's easy for us to have a small Spanish lab and see, do students like this? Do, do we get parent support? Does it seem right? That's a great way to test whether, um, you know, having languages early might make sense to do. So excited about that. Um, and looking forward to the additional ways. I've heard a lot of parents talk about um, providing students the opportunity to be trained vocationally and also maintain their Hopkins um, connection, right? We have families that go back 200, 300 years uh, as Hopkins alum to be able to graduate as a Hopkins alum and have their plumbing diploma or their carpentry diploma or their electrical, such a valuable thing. And the trades are increasing in this um, uh, more robotics um, economy. So I, uh, and also the, the housing boom. So I, I just think for a lot of reasons, these ideas make sense and worth trying on a small scale before committing all out. So uh, thank you for capturing that. Happy to. And I believe Kyle has joined us. So I think if it's okay, unless I'm sorry, so let the school committee of folks want to Maybe, maybe we could just close on this discussion yeah, and then turn our attention. No worries, no worries. Um, uh, colleagues, any other um, aspects to the um, strategic planning session to um, to highlight? I think, I think Annie, you've captured it very well, and Humera, I appreciate your um, uh, reinforcement of of the the meetings. You know, they were wonderful. I I also truly appreciated everybody's openness, and um, including the administration and staff. It was I thought a really um, helpful and uh, just collegial um, educational discussion. So I, I really appreciated it. Thanks.
I just want to add one thing real quick, just to tack on. I, I agree with everything the three of you had said thus far, and I just appreciate um, how respectful our school committee is of one another and open to ideas and open to letting us sit there for hours on end and hash it out and having it be a really civil, respectful and open environment that we can kind of say it and sometimes maybe it doesn't come out right, but somebody builds off of that and builds off of that. And in the end, it, it turns into, you know, any summary of, hey, we made some serious, some serious progress. And I appreciate that. And the only other thing I wrote down is that um, it's exciting to have your child come home and say a sentence in Spanish. I think that's fabulous. And I have heard a lot of um, positive, positive parent feedback just out and about like parents really excited that their kid is learning Spanish at, at school. So just just small little thing, but it's it's made a big impact so far. So it's exciting. Okay. Ethan, we haven't heard from you. I'm just sitting back here listening. No, I, I thought that, that the conversations were great. I, I would echo everything that's been said. I, I will also just add that as someone who came on board when uh, right around the time uh, the pandemic started, it's been, it was really nice to start thinking a little bit more long-term. You know, most of the conversations we've had in the last year have been kind of uh, in the moment and, and what are we going to do this month? What are we going to do next month? It was really it was really great to think about and imagine what uh, Hadley Public Schools looks like five, 10, 20 years down the road. And that was, that was, that was really good. And Spanish is great too. Agreed, agreed. Excellent, thank you Annie for that, um, that recap. And yes, let's go back to the awards. Yes, so Kyle, I know that you and your family are here. Tamara, I am going to make you the host because my computer just made a very strange noise, which means it could just decide to do something odd. And that way the whole meeting will not go away. Uh, you will be the host now. Um, and then you can make Kyle the co-host. Thank Terrific. you. Terrific. All right, Thank you're you. welcome. All right, Kyle and the Upneat family, I have just made you co-host. If you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself so we may present you with this award. Perfect. And you have the ability, if you would like, to um, turn your video on, that's up to you, but normally uh, participants can't, so just so you know, you can. So academically, Kyle is being awarded the Mass Association of School Superintendents Certificate of Excellence. Academically, Kyle ranks first in his extremely competitive class. He possesses a 4.51 weighted GPA. He has taken some of the most difficult courses offered at Hopkins Academy, including Advanced Placement U.S. History, AP World History, AP Language and Composition, Honors Chemistry, and Kyle has received the Seal of Biliteracy in Spanish. He decided to challenge himself during his senior year with his most rigorous course load yet, including AP Calculus, AP Spanish, AP Chemistry, and Honors Biomedical Science, in addition to two college level courses. He's a member of the Early College High School Program and will have completed four college courses by the time he graduates from Hopkins Academy. He's been awarded several top awards, including the Xerox Award for Innovation and in Information Technology, the UVM Citizen Scholar Award, the Academic Excellence Award in AP Language, the Isabella de Este Award for Enthusiasm in History, and nomination to attend the Hugh O'Brien Youth Leadership Conference. He remains an incred incredibly humble despite the countless awards and recognitions he has received. He is a natural born leader and an individual we can count on to always look out for his peers and to be a positive role model. He has served on the student council since 2016. He is a peer mentor, a member of the National Honor Society. And on top of, of all of that, he volunteers at local organizations and he works. Kyle cares deeply about everyone in our school com community and he advocates for others. And Kyle, you do have a long and impressive list of honors and awards. And uh, as was stated, people recognize the fact that you maintain, you remain humble despite all of these accomplishments. 
And what really impresses me is someone with all of your accomplishments at such a young age and all of these awards, it's easy to get accustomed to the world just looking at you because you've done so much, even as a young man. But I look at some of your volunteer work, your volunteer work at the Ronald McDonald House in Springfield, where you serve on a teen board, you're a teen board member, to ensure that families have a comfortable place when their children are in area hospitals and that they can stay there for free, that you supported a Special Olympics event and played in the Hopkins Academy Pep Band at the Special Olympics basketball games and provided encouragement for those athletes and entertainment for the spectators. And also that you participated in Ride to Remember. So you supported more than 350 cyclists in a 100 mile biking charity event. And you staffed five rest stops by distributing food and water bottles to those riders and picking up trash. So for someone who, for good reason, is probably accustomed to having people talk about you and look at you and all the wonderful things that you do, I'm impressed with the fact that you clearly see how important it is to see others, that to be seen is nice, but to have the moral and emotional wisdom to see others, that's what matters most. And clearly by the things that you do in your volunteer time, you see that and you live that. And so congratulations and thank you for contributing so much to our school. Yeah, thank you for this. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm, thank you for having me today too. I'm sorry I'm late. I had a soccer game. But yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, congratulations, Kyle, and also to the Upneat family. Annie, that was a beautiful um, tribute to a, an amazing young man. Thank you. Congratulations. Terrific. Okay. Um, we are going to continue moving down this agenda. And um, next up is the per diem rates for substitute nurses. Annie. And you are on mute. And I need to, I need to make you co-host. Hang on one second. We, we got the charades on that one. <laughs> Here we go. You're all set now. Okay, sorry. When I made you the host, I became um, a participant. So there you go. I didn't realize that. Um, great. And Kyle, your certificate will be in the Hopkins Academy office tomorrow morning. Uh, okay, so per diem uh, rates for substitute nurses. Uh, we are, like many districts, really struggling to find substitute nurses at the moment. The average rate currently, we pay $150 per day for a substitute school nurse. The average rate right now in um, Hampshire County is 165. However, I am recommending the school committee uh, support and approve a rate of 175 per day because I also know that many of those uh, school committees are, or school districts are in active discussion about raising their rate to 175. So rather than just keep coming back, I'm recommending that we have a per diem rate for substitute nurses of $175 per day. Do I hear a motion? Just a question, I'm sorry. Um, I'm assuming financially, Chris, and I mean, that we've modeled this and the impact to the district and we're, we're good. We're able to support that. I would say overall, the district is in, is in good financial shape, shape at the moment. And this also would be a cost that could potentially be something that we could use ESSER funding for if we needed to, although that's not our current reality. Thank you. I don't have any questions. I would motion to approve to increase the substitute nursing per diem rate to 175. Great, thank you, Chair. Do we hear a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. All right, so approval of Hartsbrook. Annually, the school committee is required and Paul isn't even here. I finally have the law for him because I know that he always asks, why do we do this? Is that 
especially oddly under the compulsory attendance law. So under MGL 76, section one, the local school committee is required to approve all private schools operating within its geographic boundaries, like K through 12 schools, not every daycare that operates here, and uh, or early childhood center, excuse me. And so annually you approve uh, Hearts Brooks operation and operating plan. Um, and I let you know that I have reviewed all of the required documentation, which is delineated in the school committee policy LBCAE-2. Um, and I have reviewed it and I'm recommending to the school committee that once again, we approve the operation of Hartsbrook School. Great, thank you, Annie. Does anyone have any questions? No. Okay, do I hear a motion to approve? Motion to approve Hartsbrook School. Uh, for the 20, 21 to 22 year. Terrific. Do second. I have a second? Okay, terrific. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. And so next we have possible winter concert at Hopkins Academy and the decision making steps around that. Annie. Just, just so folks know, so we are planning uh, putting together. Uh, Mr. Fazio, Fazio is putting together a plan for an in-person concert, which we will also, just as we did with graduation, put together a plan, have the Board of Health review it and give us the thumbs up. But we will not commit to that finally, we're planning for it, until about one week before. And gosh, I wish I had the date right in front of me. But essentially think about two weeks after Thanksgiving, uh, we'll be Looking at the data, we will um, talk to the Board of Health, and if they give us the green light, we'd have an in-person concert with everything they've approved. And if for some reason, um, things were not going in the direction that we had hoped, we would have a virtual concert as we have in the past. But I just wanted families to understand there's a reason why we're waiting to commit. Um, really uh, just, we would always wanna be as looking at the most recent data as, as practically possible, and particularly given the fact that uh, Thanksgiving is a high contact and bustling holiday, we want to take that into consideration as well. That makes a lot of sense, Annie. Um, if there is a concert, is there already a date in mind? Did you already mention that? You know what? I'm going to look it up for you. I okay. feel like it is. Uh, I should have known that, and I don't. I feel like it is the week of December 13th. I feel like it is that. And, but uh, I don't, I don't know for sure. <laughs> okay. that's, that's helpful. Yeah. Very good. So Thank about you. one week in advance of that. So no decision or vote is needed for this. No. Just letting folks know. Terrific. Uh, the last item on the presentations part of the agenda, contingency, contingency planning, transportation and food services. Yes, so um, just folks hear this story nationally. This is a very tight labor market. School districts across the country and in Massachusetts are struggling to keep their transportation services and food services fully staffed. Um, that has been a real challenge as you've probably heard the stories about the governor sending the National Guard to some districts to assist at least with transportation. So uh, what we are doing, where we are now is first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you to people in the community, to grandparents and community members who have responded to my endless requests for, for helping us. Our food service department is fully staffed at the moment. It's fantastic, thank you. And that really, there are grandparents in that department that are doing short shifts for us and we really appreciate it. With transportation, I again want to say how appreciative I am of our partner, Five Star. They go above and beyond to try to help us problem solve. They also are struggling you know, to find drivers. So um, we are, we're making it through day by day. I want folks to know the contingency planning is both in transportation and in food service. We're going, we have already started thinking through all right, well, if we get to this point, so for example, we simply do not have enough drivers to do every single run. How do we notify parents? 
What's the fallback plan? The laws in Massachusetts require us to transport students in grades K through five who live more than two miles away. Um, and so at what does it look like if we're only transporting the legal minimum? How would we communicate to parents? I am not suggesting to families that the school committee is thinking, yep, that's what we're gonna do. I'm talking about this as a contingency plan to make sure that school remains open. There was a story in Vermont a couple of weeks ago in Southwest Vermont, they had to close school because they didn't have enough buses. Um, so know that we're working on this and when we have those contingency plans that kind of lay out a flow chart, at this point, this happens, at this point, this happens, this is how you get notified. And because sometimes this happens because people get sick, they're allowed to do that, it happens. That notification could be day of notification. But um, our goal is to at least that families will understand and school committee will get a chance to review and make you know, suggestions for revisions or changes what the process is, like how each kind of, what each fall, what, what uh, triggers a fall back plan and what that looks like is what I'm trying to say. So more to come, but we are working on it. I don't want the community to think, gosh, given the fact that this is really a problem, are they just sitting back and crossing their fingers and throwing pennies and wishing wells. No, we're, we are planning. So I do want families to know that. Thank you for having a fallback position and also good news that your outreach efforts have resulted in some help. Um, I, I know that your um, superintendent newsletters are, um, are very much a hot item and people you know, really pay attention to those those, um, those um, when they come out. One thing, I don't know that um, you've made any announcements by way of our um, school committee uh, video, which is televised. And I'm wondering whether, uh, is there still a need and would it make sense for you to recap what that need might be now? Transportation. So thank you, Humera. So transportation. And if you are remotely interested, even if you don't have, if you are just driving a Toyota Prius and you think, I'm not really sure if I can even drive a bus, uh, call us, email me. We'll find out what you can do. And also we've said any interest is not too boutique or odd. So someone might say, I wouldn't mind helping out to be to do athletic trips if I had the right licenses. I wouldn't mind helping out transporting students in a special education van or so anything, please email me and um, I will put you in touch with the right people about learning what you might need to do, what kinds of license you might need to possess and training that's required. And we would work with you to um, try to make sure that um, we can train you without, uh, without expenses to the person getting trained. So please transportation, we need, even if you just want to sub, we need help with transportation. Great. Well, um, thank you for that. And, um, you know, true story, I've always wanted to learn how to uh, drive a bus ever since I was at Smith and I would take five college classes. I always admired the way those PVTA bus drivers handle that bus. So maybe one day, Annie, if we get that <laughs> enough, I'll pitch in um, because it, it's, it, would, it would fulfill a lifelong dream of mine in addition to the many other things that I do. Um, thank you for that. Okay, so we're at the, uh, the business manager report. Chris, are you hanging in there? Are you ready to, uh, I think I need to make you a co-host. Hang on one second. Yes. Oh, terrific. Yep, he is. Can you, let me text him. Maybe he can't hear it. Or maybe he texted me that something is wrong. Mm -hmm. Sorry uh, about that. That's oh, okay. okay, and I apologize. My daughter had just asked me a question about what was for dinner and I was answering her and I missed what you said. So I'm very sorry for that. Can you no just repeat No worries it, please? at all. Yep, no, you're on for the business manager reports. Okay, Plans, great. Revolving grants, all the things. All right, um, so we can start with the regular expense report that we get every month. Um, if you scroll through this report, there are a lot of accounts which look, maybe not alarmingly, but quite a bit over budget at this point in time. Um, that is really just because the grants are still um, 
in somewhat of a state of flux. And by that, what I mean is they haven't all been approved officially yet. So until we get them with the official approval, I can't transfer expense over to them. Um, so what we end up with is um, say sped tuitions on the 240 grant, we normally charge about $150,000. Those are all sitting with their encumbrances right now in the regular budget. Um, there's been a number of IT expenses that we budgeted to be used in the ESSER two or ESSER three grants for COVID expenses. Again, right now we did get approval for ESSER two, so I can do those transfers, but still not for ESSER three. Um, every district in the state has those. We did reach out last week and ask, uh, you know, just if we could have some kind of a timeline for approval. And we got a response back that they are just drowning in grant applications and they are getting to them. And I forgot how, how far down the list we were, but they said uh, probably another couple of weeks or so. Um, it's not a concern on whether or not we will be approved for it. We know we will. It's just a question of they have to review the application and make sure we're good on it. So um, once those get done, that's quite honestly why you don't have the grant expense report yet, because I don't really have any expenses to show on it. You know, we, we haven't gotten the official approvals. And what happens is if you do the transfers before they officially approve it, auditors don't tend to like that. Um, and so they'll say something like, oh, you were approved for your 240 grant on October 1st. And I see you have expenses from September in there. And, and you know, they don't like that at all. So we do really have to wait until they're approved. Um, but that being said, uh, you know, there are also many accounts in there that we have a lot of money sitting in. So, um, you know, any kind of overage that we may see are obviously going to be offset by other, either by grants or other accounts that have surpluses in them. Um, another account that I didn't mention, uh, we had some facilities expenses in the summer, just again, going through the heating units in the classrooms and making sure that everything was up to snuff, everything was functioning correctly. Um, those will be transferred as well to the ESSER grants once we get the final approval for ESSER three. So um, again, looking good financially. I mean, we're in great shape as far as both the budget and the uh, revolving accounts go. So great. any questions at all on the budget report? No questions for me. I don't see any okay. from my colleagues. Okay. Then I have just the revolving account report. Did you guys get that? I sent it in on Friday, but I don't know if it was got after. It today. Just got, got it today. Great. Okay. Um, so again, if we if we just look at that report, really looking very good. Um, the athletic account, we haven't seen any um, deposits to that account in quite some time, but. We did get some over the summer and especially in September for uh, tournament events that we had at Hopkins uh, last year. So that big jump in September is the reason for that. We got, I don't know, about $3,000 or so um, for tournaments that were held here. So that was certainly nice to see. Um, lunch account, as you can see, that's, that's taken about a $30,000 hit from uh, June 30th to now. Again, as we've seen several times with the lunch account, we're missing an entire month's worth of revenues in that. So I would expect it would bring it up to probably around 135 or something once those are posted. Um, preschool account, we started at 81, we're still at 79. So really, uh, you know, after a couple of months, we're looking pretty good in that account. That's nice to see. And student activity, very little change. The same with Hadley Kids. We've had a number of expenses with Hadley Kids, but as you can see, the deposits that were put in that account pretty much kept us right about at the same point that we started at. So again, really nice to see. And the school choice, that balance is looking very large right now. Again, we have, uh, I forgot the exact amount, I can look it up, but it was over $700,000 in anticipated expenses for the budget um, for this particular school year. So, you know, that'd bring us down to a million dollars and then we will see, um, basically about anywhere from 50 to $70,000 per month going through the rest of the school year. So that's gonna bring the balance back up again. That's a funding source, you know, quite honestly, that if we had a particular project or something that we would love to get accomplished and we just didn't think we had the funds for it, that's something that we actually do have funds sitting there for. So 
certainly a good situation to be in. That's uh, it's unusual to have a balance that high, but it, it's also good to have it just in case. And we did, you reminded me, Chris, that as part of the strategic planning, the school committee did talk at length about the school choice balance. And as part of that conversation, that those funds, when we are looking at things such as improvements to HVAC systems and other things that ESSER money and um, school choice can be places that we, would be sources of funding to support those kinds of improvements. Yep. Great, any questions for Chris? All right, Chris. Okay, I apologize for missing the question too. I, I just got the request from the kitchen about what kind of noodles are we having tonight? So I had that to- That was our uh, question too. What's for dinner? <laughs> had to be sure to answer that, that's all. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right, we're on to uh, school committee reports and discussion. Uh, CES, Heather. Okay, so I had the opportunity to finally attend my first uh, CES meeting. It was really nice to see everyone. Um, it was very well attended for um, all the representatives across uh, Hampshire and Franklin and uh, different counties. So and all of the different districts that are members. Um, so there, it began with a new member orientation, which I attended and then the regular meeting. So I had a chance, an opportunity to meet with a smaller group right up front. And Humera, you were definitely missed, you know, so it was nice to be able to just continue on with our representation there. Um, we heard from the new executive director, Todd Gazda, um, and he provided a report to the board, which I shared with you all uh, after that. But I just wanted to mention they had four strategic goals that he outlined in there and provided um, really deep information about um, how they were, you know, attempting to accomplish those goals, the initiatives that they have, how they map to those goals. So those four strategic goals, um, goal number one is meeting member district needs. Uh, goal two is fostering the success of children, youth, and families with a focus on those placed at risk. Goal three is developing exemplary educators. And goal four is innovative practices. So when we look at the programs that the collaborative has, the initiatives that they are undertaking, um, they really do map back strongly to these four goals. Um, one thing I'll just mention in closing, uh, coming up in December, it just came out um, this week, is that they are scheduling a discussion of the collaborative strategic goals for the next five-year strap plan. Um, so they're they're planning their long-term five-year strategic plan. There's two meetings that I'll participate in. In the first meeting, they will review the new and updated uh, SWOT analyses. So that's the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats um, developed by departments. And they'll consider the implications of what they got from that. And then in the second meeting, they'll work in groups to develop goals and objectives that guide um, the collaborative in the coming years using a consensus-based approach for goal setting, which will benefit greatly from participation across the departments, as well as the different roles within the collaborative. Um, so that's happening the 9th and the 10th of December. Um, so I'll look forward to bringing you all an update after that takes place. And I know, Annie, you were also mentioned as just a, you know, um, a really valuable thought partner uh, with the collaborative. So I also appreciate your presence and, and leadership with that uh, group. Heather, thank you so much for um, participating. Uh, first of all, an, a one, thorough and wonderful um, uh, update and also for participating in that strategic plan. The organization has um, uh, just such a positive impact on the member districts and is so responsive to our needs. And for you to be in at the ground floor at the heels of our two-day strategic uh, planning session can really feed in nicely to what um, what we see as important for Hadley's districts, Hadley's district, but also surrounding districts. So it's really such a great opportunity to help set the stage for the next five years. Thank you for um, contributing to that. You're welcome. I'm looking forward to it. So thanks. Does anyone have any questions for Heather? 
Okay, terrific. Thank you. And on to finance, Ethan. Uh, I've got no updates for finance this, this month. Okay, great. Thank you, Ethan. And policy, Tara. Um, so we met tonight um, for policy and attached on the agenda is a link for the first reading for the flag policy. Um, it was a legal opinion um, put forward by Dupre office who the district uses um, as their legal advisors that we um, implement a flag policy. Um, so that is after that reading um, today, after we reviewed it today, um, we felt it was appropriate to bring it forward for a first reading um, tonight to share with you all. Um, and I know you haven't had a chance probably before this to read it because we just did put that in and it was one of the adjustments um, in the agenda. And I don't know if you can see it or if I should read it for everybody to hear. Tara, that might be nice. It's super short. So yeah, it's very short. Um, so Hadley flag and banner policy. Uh, it shall be the policy of the Hadley School Committee to only permit the flying of the American flag or banners and the Massachusetts state flag or banners on school grounds and or in school buildings. Any group or organization wishing to affix a flag or banner on school grounds and or school buildings must submit a written request to the school committee along with a picture or drawing of the proposed flag or banner showing all measurements and colors. Requests will be reviewed and approved or denied on a case by case basis and no decision by the school committee will be considered um, precedent setting for future requests, including the same group or organization. So that's that's it. Again, this came from the um, attorney's office and they did propose a recommendation um, that we do have something in place should this um, come up in the future. So I have a question. Um, it's not regarding the policy, but more about if the policy goes through and is enacted, are there criteria or a sample of, you know, what's our guide in reviewing those case by case requests? Like, is there guidance that there that go along with that policy to help us out? Heather, that's a really good question. And we, um, uh, we, we had a good deal of sort of uh, discussion about what that would look like. And honestly, we would look at our, um, our various uh, school committee policies on um, uh, policies like the racism resolution or policies like the um, our uh, school committee norms. And so uh, does a certain uh, flag or image uh, represent the ideals that we wish to uphold of kindness and respect and inclusiveness? Um, and we would need to take it by uh, case by case basis in order to um, to make that determination. No, that's helpful. It sounds like um what may be next then for us is to actually outline those steps and those sources that we would be going to and kind of the questions that we would be asking about the nature of the request and it, its alignment or non-alignment to our, our various source documents, like you mentioned. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Annie, does that make sense from the standpoint of a light procedures document that may um, just provide uh, the scaffold needed to bring such requests to us? Yes. Or maybe like a checkbox, like a question, does this meet X criteria based on X? You know, you can check the boxes to make sure that right. we're not being discriminatory, offensive, and in line with the district's plans. It could be pretty simple. simple. Yeah. Yeah. Simple is fine. It, it's more about um, that we have a standardized process for evaluating the request, not that it doesn't vary. We don't want it to vary depending on the request. Yeah, really good point. Thank you. Any other comments on this? All right, so we shall consider this for first reading and we'll bring it back in the November meeting for second reading. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Um, and there, I think there's one other item. Sure, I'm happy to speak to that because it isn't at this point a policy first reading. This is just uh, the policy subcommittee. I informed them of the fact that I had sought a legal opinion regarding students uh, requesting changes in pronouns, the pronouns that they're referred to in school. And um, what does the law say about uh, students' requests for using a particular pronoun 
and uh, parent notification. And the law is very clear when there's a request to change something on a student record. And the law is not uh, nearly as clear in terms of regulations regarding um, parent notification and student initiated request to use a different pronoun that is not that does not constitute an official request. I want to underscore this is when a student makes this request and however, does not make it as an official request, i.e. please change my educational record to reflect this request. Um, and so there are uh, recommendations always, and it is a priority of this district to always engage with parents as partners and with families. And um, it is always recommended that the, the safety and well-being of the student is also taken into consideration. And so the legal opinion we received uh, spoke to that. And next we will go back to the uh, attorney and ask for recommendations regarding um, a more a, a policy as opposed to just legal opinions aren't the same as policies So recommendations for a draft policy. The policy subcommittee will review that in the meeting. Any draft policy is always brought before the school committee for a first reading, for a second reading, and there'd be an invitation to public comment as there is at every school committee meeting. Right now, we just have reviewed a legal opinion, not Hadley Public Schools opinion, not the school committee's opinion, but a legal opinion. And now we'll be requesting uh, the school committee attorney or the attorney for Hadley Public Schools to draft a policy that you can review and discuss. Great, thank you, Annie. Um, I, for one, am uh, appreciative of making it clear what we would do in such an instance so there isn't any ambiguity and we're not making it up as we go along. So thank you for investigating this. Okay, um, any, any questions on that for Annie? Okay, terrific. Um, moving on, Fields and Capital, Paul is not here. Annie, is there anything? Sure, uh, yes. So we are, um, we do have some funds remaining from phase one, next would be phase two. Chris is doing a fantastic job of um, communicating with Berkshire Design who helped us with phase one and communicating with the Inspector General's office. So what we're looking to do next would be to make sure that we follow uh, proper procurement to get um, designs for phase two and bid specifications so that we can go out to bid on the work. And then Paul and I would uh, be presenting to CPA an update on phase one. We'd like to then have bid specifications and uh, designs in hand for phase two um, and to get a sense of if um, the CPA might entertain providing some financial support for phase two of the project. So that's where we are right now and we'll keep you posted. Thank you. And I think Chris might have something to uh, mention in this regard, possibly. I do, yes. Um, so I had contacted the inspector general's office just to get an opinion from them on how we should handle the procurement of the design work. Um, I received a call back this afternoon telling me I needed to speak to a certain person who handled um, building and design and they were at the attorney general's office. So I called that person where the voicemail said she was working remotely and I needed to send an email to this email address. I sent the email to that email address and I got an auto response saying that she was working remotely and had no access to email or phone. So this is how these things go sometimes. So I will continue to chase this down but um, if, if there's a delay, this is why. Um, but I, I did wanna mention, yeah, we do have funds available about $35,000 from the phase one of the project. So that will pay for you know, a good portion of the design work um, for phase two. Um, and what we really have to do at this point um, is we need to first find out what method of procurement we can use. Um, can we use one that 
just goes by price? Can we use one that takes the qualifications of the vendors into account and we choose with that method and not with pricing? Uh, and that's, you know, you don't really want to mess with this. You want to make sure you get it right. Um, so that's, that's what we're in the process of doing right now. Um, but either way, I, I would anticipate, I'm not really sure what to do. I was, I actually didn't do anything when I got that email, hoping that it might've just been an auto reply and I would get a response. So I'm going to give it a day or two before, I don't even know what to do <laughs> at this point in time, but I'm going to try to find who else to call and uh, and get an answer so we can just move forward. We'd, it'd be nice to try to nail this down in the next couple of weeks as to what we need to do. Thank you, Chris, for uh, for following up on that. You know, it, I, I find that that is not unusual in light of this great reopening back from the pandemic. There's so many different parts of our society right now that are in that same kind of loop, and just like having a little bit, having a hard time just getting back up and running to the same degree. So thank you for just bird dogging that and, um, and making judicious use of any unspent funds to make that happen. Okay. All right. Uh, we're on to negotiations, Pfeiffer and Percy. So Ethan and, and Paul, Paul's not here, Ethan. Yeah, I'll just uh, quickly uh, talk a little bit about the negotiations with HEA around uh, vaccine mandates. I think first, uh, the, the first thing is just to acknowledge, as Annie mentioned earlier, the incredibly high, <clears throat> excuse me, incredibly high vaccine rates among the educators at, at both Hopkins Academy and, and Hadley Elementary. I think that, that's just awesome, to be, to be honest. Um, the, the second thing is just given the fact that OSHA's announcement seems relatively imminent, it, it, we uh, decided to kind of hold off on making any decisions or having any more conversations until we heard kind of what had been uh, given to us uh, in terms of guidance around vaccine mandates from OSHA. So that's kind of where we're at now. And, and Annie, I don't know if there's anything else you wanna add. No, I think that's, that's that perfectly. Great, any questions for Ethan? Okay, terrific. Thank you, Ethan and Paul for uh, continuing to shepherd that conversation. And um, finally, uh, we need to appoint school committee representatives for unit A negotiations and for unit D. This is from the contract that they had a one year extension to June 30. So all contracts expire, those two, con two contracts expire on June 30. And we wanna get one for July 1 of 2022 through, um, June 30, three years away. For about three unit A. Both unit units. A. Okay, great. So um, I know Paul's not here, um, but I wonder, um, Annie, do you need this tonight? Um, no, that's okay. We can. Um, I seriously doubt that the HEA is looking to start scheduling negotiations, meetings, before Thanksgiving, because we're coming up to the Thanksgiving holiday, but probably at our next meeting we should, so we can start getting the ball rolling, especially because budget development, other things will happen in short order. So we can move it to November. Okay, okay. great. So I would, uh, I'd love to just float out there that any um, volunteerism to uh, be on either one of these contracts would be uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, I, I, for one, am traveling about every other week these days, so I would, um, uh, I will pitch in as needed, um, but if there's a willingness, um, so anyway, I'll just, uh, any excitement there might be to be on the um, negotiating committee would be warmly received. Annie, can you remind us, um, unit A and unit D, are there yes, so teachers and educational? Sorry, yeah, teachers and educational support professionals, I should have been clear about that. And folks here who have done negotiations in the past, which I think is a vast majority, um, it is uh, in this district, I would say, I mean, knock wood in this district, it is a um, truly like a wonderful and painless process. And uh, that's because 
I think there's good working relationships and people are very interested in logical conversations. We collect a lot of data in advance right now. We're in the process of gathering all the data, the comparable wage data for the region. Um, so we have a lot of data that drives the discussion and it moves it along um, efficiently, I should say. We don't rush through things unnecessarily, but it's a very efficient conversation. And, and with Zoom, there never was an easier time to schedule and meet. Um, so um, we, we, are, we are in good, good stead for uh, solid and easy negotiations, I hope. Yes, and it's typically a subcommittee is two school committee members. We need a subcommittee for each one, unit A and unit D. There's nothing that says that a person couldn't say, yeah, I'm willing, I'll be on both of those. That's fine too, but they are two separate sets of negotiations. Great. I will throw my hat in the ring for unit A. Um, as a preliminary, I know we need to, but I am interested in doing that. Great. Thank you. That would be wonderful. I've, I've appreciated doing that in the past. I really do like working um, with them and hearing from them. And I think it is very helpful to hear um, what their kind of, you know, what's top of mind for them in thinking about these negotiations looking ahead. I was going to offer unit A to myself as well, only because I think I've done unit B, uh, unit D before. Um, I don't think I've done unit A, but I'm happy to step aside if somebody's really excited to do that too. <laughs> That's okay by me, but I'm happy to, to do A or if somebody, again, is pressing, I'll do D. That's fine. Thank you, Tara. Ethan, do you have a sense for where you'd like to be? No, I'm happy to do whatever. I think I did unit D last year. Happy to do it again. Yeah, I'm, I'm down for whatever. Okay. Um, so I would say if, if we could, uh, I mean, maybe we should just finalize next month and just um, think on it some more. And I, um, there, I see no reason why we couldn't give everyone what they wished to do. So thank you for expressing your um, interests and let's hear from Paul as well. And finalize at the next meeting. Perfect. Sounds good. Great. Okay. All right. So um, we're on to item seven announcements. So I wonder if any of you all have announcements for today's meeting. Okay. Um, I will um, just put out that there uh, that I have a quick announcement and that is that we are on the third um, of a three-part series called Indigenous Matters that Hadley Learns has been spearheading along with uh, the library and the Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, schools, and the Senior Center. And this um, third event is uh, a, a book reading. There are two books. Uh, one is called uh, I Will. Uh, I will, colon, how four American Indians put their lives on the line and changed history. And the other is braided sweetgrass, colon, indigenous wisdom, scientific knowledge, and the teachings of plants. And that's a really good one around ecology and balance and climate change. And it just has like five star ratings and 30,000 people who have read it. And so even if you take in a video summary and are able to join us, we welcome that. That is this uh, uh, next, thir uh, so Thursday, November 4th. Let's see, that would be mm, next Thursday. Next Thursday, that's right. Mm -hmm. Next Thursday, seven o'clock to 8.30, you can uh, RSVP at hadleylearns.com. Okay, that is it for my announcements. Um, and we are on to uh, the final item of the agenda. I believe, Annie, we are um, going into executive session. No, sorry. Uh, oh. I think you can go. I, I'm sorry, I should have done that as an, an adjustment. I always okay. do that. You can see where it says move to go in to discuss. Yeah, like nothing not further happening. after that. So that okay. I should have said, we don't need to do that. We just have your action items, remaining action items okay. and confirming our next uh, meeting date. Okay, terrific. So an approval of minutes of September 20th, 2021. Uh, I wonder if there's a motion on the table. So moved. And a second. I think Tara Mouth second. 
second it. Can you hear me? Oh, uh, now we can. Now oh, we can. Second it. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. Um, approval of policy subcommittee minutes. Uh, and let for... me clarify for people just so yeah. they know anybody can vote on this. Jenny Tate has said that you don't have to have been there. Like you can vote to approve policy subcommittee minutes, an absent person can. I just wanted to make that clear to people. Great. And this is for May 24, June 28, July 26, and August 30th. Do I hear a motion? So moved. So moved. Second. All right, terrific. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, thank you. Uh, next, approval of AP warrants for September 2021. And this is the one that um, Heather, you um, abstained from. Terrific. So do I hear a motion to approve the AP warrants for September? So, so moved. Second. Okay, <laughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 Terrific, motion passes. Uh, approval of warrants for September 2021, and I believe this is the one that Paul abstains from, so we can all vote here. Uh, motion to approve. So moved. And do I hear a second? Second. Second. One <laughs> favor. Third. Aye. 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 All right, excellent. I'm out of here. This is... <laughs> I promise it'll get smoother, it'll get smoother. Um, the substitute nursing per diem, I think we already motioned and approved mm -hmm. that. And then uh, we also approved Hartsbrook. Mm -hmm. So we are good to go there. Next meeting dates um, are November 22nd for policy subcommittee at five and a regular school committee at 530. Um, I'm just going to, and that is the Monday before, before Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. That, yeah. I'm, I won't be traveling that week. That tends to, that, that seems to work fine on my end. Uh, is it all, is it okay for you all? Good? Yes. Good. All right, terrific. All right, we are good there. And I think that is it. Uh, wow, eight minutes shy of our seven o'clock goal. Um, I think we can call this meeting to an end. Do I hear a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. <laughs> All in favor. Aye. 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 All right. Thank you, everyone, for a wonderful and efficient. Good night, guys. Good, Good night. night. Guys.